here and on behalf of the entire Older Adult Ministry Committee of the Pennington Presbyterian Church, I welcome you to our second annual Veterans Day program. Last year, our Veterans Day program was our best attended program of the entire year. So the committee members agreed instantly, immediately, that we would do a similar program this year, inviting other veterans to share their stories. We especially welcome our four veterans and the widows of two other veterans who are speaking today. We extend deep appreciation for the service of each of these veterans and for your willingness to share your stories. And for all the other veterans with us today, thank you too for your service. Finally, we thank every one of you who have joined us on this important day when we recognize and honor and remember our country's veterans in this very special way. Let us begin with prayer. And who gave their best when they were called upon to serve and protect their country. We pray that you will bless them for their unselfish service in the continual struggle to preserve our freedoms, our safety, and our country's heritage. Okay, um, just a few words about um, the formatting for today. Uh, first of all, um, as I mentioned before, please mute yourself. Um, I will introduce each of the six speakers at the appropriate time and they will each have eight to 10 minutes to share some memories of their military service. Um, a question and answer period will come at the end for all of the speakers. So please use the chat box for your questions and comments. Um, today's program is being recorded and in time it will appear on the YouTube page of the Pennington Presbyterian Church. Um, so folks who are not able to join us today will be able to hear these important stories as well. Our first speaker is Bill Kianka, Captain U.S. Air Force, who will discuss flying jet fighters. Bill? Good afternoon, and I am Bill Kianka. And first, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this group on this special day. So we give thanks and honor to all the veterans because of their service to our country, which we enjoy peace. Um, I served in the Air Force as a pilot. So today I'd like to talk about something which a number of people have asked me, how did you ever get to that part of flying jet planes? So uh, that's what I'm really gonna focus on today and I hope it's informative. And I go way back to 1955, I'm an old geezer. You know. So at that time I uh, applied for the aviation, US Air Force Aviation Cadet Pilot Training uh, course and involved taking exams and a physical, and uh, which I did. And um, thankfully I passed and was indoctrinated. And then they sent me down to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas for what they call pre-flight. This was a three month training course. Basically it was indoctrination into the military life and it involved classes and uh, physical training, much physical training and um, a lot of intimidation since I was a, a, a new cadet. So uh, you understand that. So after the three months, <clears throat> Uh, I was assigned to a base in North Carolina, um, Stahl Air Force Base, and uh, for start my flying career. And it started out, naturally, you go from little ones to bigger ones. And the first one uh, naturally um, was, and I'm not going to show you, a, a Piper Cub, a little yellow airplane. Um, which a lot of people are familiar with. And I had the honor of being the last class in the U.S. Air Force to start training in this little, little airplane. And so uh, I was an you know, assigned instructor and 
uh, naturally, we start our training and uh, uh, practicing takeoffs and landings and all the other phases of flight of, of uh, doing stalls and uh, spins and um, all the other things and learning how to land. And finally, after eight hours, he thought I was good enough to go on my own. And he got out of the airplane and said, so I'm on my own. And so I did as absolute, you know, solo on that uh, flight. And from then on, went back with him and got 20 more hours of, of flight time. And then it was time to move up to a little bit bigger airplane, uh, much, much more powerful. And I'll show you a picture of it. It's called a T-28. And now uh, this was a 800 horsepower and it looked like a monster to me going from the Piper Cove. So, uh, so in order to get in this, and this will involve all net airplanes following this, that you have to go through ground school learning what it makes it what makes it tick you know everything about all the systems and all the normal operations and abnormal and emergencies and most of these you have to memorize so um then again we started off learning how to take off and land and uh, and uh, do all the other phases of flight such as stalls and recovery from stalls and we did spins on this. When I say spins, I mean, this is intentionally making the airplane not fly anymore and going straight down and uh, trying to recover from that. And um, also it in, involved acrobatics learning, uh, all the phases of acrobatics and also um, instrument flying. So this airplane um, had two seats naturally one behind the other and, and in the back seat was equipped with all the instruments and controls the same as the front so when you sat in the back and instructor in the front you pull down this thing it's just like a baby carriage you know they can't see out so what do you do you have to fly by instruments so uh, we got a lot of practice um, keeping the airplane up in the air flying by instruments and um, and then we got night flying and all the other phases, but I'm not going to get into all the details. But after six months, uh, we got uh, naturally our check ride, uh, taking tests and so forth, and passed that. And then I was, thankfully, I was assigned from there to go on to jet training, which was in uh, Black, in, um, not right near Del Rio, Texas, and um, so um, Laughlin Air Force Base. Now, flying jets is totally different from a propeller airplane. It goes a lot faster, a lot smoother, quieter, but you really have to be ahead of the airplane. So naturally, we had to go through the same ordeal, ground school, learning everything about it, and then uh, learning how to take off and land with it. And, uh, but now it gets a little more complicated. Um, we get into, uh, into uh, formation flying, learning how to do that and naturally acrobatics but naturally we didn't do spins <laughs> god forbid if we went in a spin with a jet that wouldn't be too good so uh we learned you know all the phases of flight and when with the instrument flying it got a lot more detailed you know like flying missions behind you know underneath and uh, learning how to approach for a landing and uh, get down to about 100 feet, then the instructor would take over and land the airplane. Of course, you can't land from the back seat. You can't see out. But uh, anyway, uh, we did night flying and um, cross country. And um, then after the six months, that's where we went for our exams and we graduate just like high school, you know, you get your diploma. And I got my commission and got my wings and then I was assigned for air, and I was very, very fortunate to be assigned to um, to fighters and um, planes for training for advanced training, and that was in, um, also in Texas. And but now that's a single seat airplane, so uh, and being a single seat, well, now you don't have an instructor you can sit back there. And, instruct you so you had to go for a, a simulator now here's this picture of the 
uh, fighter plane, which I was assigned to. Um, so you went through the whole course, going through the simulator, and then naturally um, onto the airplane and then uh, uh, learned to you know, do missions with that, daytime, nighttime, um, making, uh, you know, uh, approaches and um, on, on other targets here. We didn't use real bullets or, or missiles. <laughs> what we did, it was recording a little box that we took out and uh, recorded everything. So after every mission, we sit back and then replay it and see how well we did, whether we did bad or good or whatnot. Um, and so um, uh, after six months of that, then um, I was, got my orders and we didn't have a choice then. The Air Force sent you wherever they felt there was a need. So, and then I was sent to Shaw Air Force Base in uh, South Carolina to fly photo reconnaissance RF uh, 101 Voodoo's. And there's a picture of the uh, airplane. And uh, this went very, very fast. It was a twin engine, short stubbly wings, and it went like a rocket and uh, it had cameras. So I turned to be a uh, photographer. So um, and I, I flew that airplane for uh, real life until I was released from the Air Force. And when I came out, then I joined the New Jersey Air National Guard and then to fly fighters again. So uh, that's basically my story and uh, I hope it was informative. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Bill. That was indeed informative. And um, I, I particularly, uh, as a former teacher back in the day, like the fact that you used visual aids. <laughs> I like the pictures. I like the, the model. That was good. That was helpful. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Our next speaker is going to be Marilyn Rutledge. <laughs> We recount the experiences of her now, unfortunately, deceased husband, Chuck Rutledge, who was a, a sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps and um, was at the Battle of Chosun Reservoir, North Korea. Marilyn, it's all yours. Good afternoon. I'm honored to pay tribute to my late husband, Sergeant Charles Rutledge, whom I'll call Chuck but is also known in our family as Supermarine. His experiences during the Korean War at the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir are absolutely beyond belief. The battle is widely considered to be one of the Corps' greatest triumphs, despite being, only, being one of the only instances in which the Marines were forced to retreat. I didn't know Chuck then, for I was a youngster in elementary school with no idea what was happening on the other side of the world, especially back in those days. It wasn't until 15 years later when I was in grad school and he was a visiting professor that we met. For years after marriage, Chuck said little of his wartime experiences. Then after we attended the dedication of the Korean War Memorial in Washington, DC in 1995, he began to open up. At the dedication ceremony, we sat in a roped off section reserved for survivors of the Battle of the Chosen. Within a few feet of the main speakers, President Bill Clinton and the President of South Korea. I wish you'd be hearing these words from Chuck today. I'll speak of memories he shared with me, plus those of Charles Kim, his close wartime lifetime friend with whom I spoke earlier this week from his home in California. Although Charles was of a higher rank, they were both in intelligence in the 1st Marine Division. These veterans memories, along with numerous books and online articles, enabled me to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Let's go back to 1950. After Korea invaded South Korea on June 25th, the United Nations, with the United States as a principal participant, joined the war on the side of the South Koreans. China came to North Korea's aid. On October 15th, Chuck, stationed at Camp Pendleton, sent the following telegram to his parents. Leaving for Japan Sunday, 
don't worry, keep writing, love Chuck. Little did he know he would be the only one of the six in his company not to return in a body bag, or more likely, only their dog tags reach the families. In early November of that year, a cold front from Siberia descended over the chosen reservoir. Temperatures plunged as low as minus 36, sometimes 40 below. This was the frozen chosen. November 23rd, Thanksgiving Day, Chuck often spoke of the troops being with a sense of optimism as they enjoyed their special Thanksgiving dinner at the Chosen. They were looking forward to being back home by Christmas as promised. However, four nights later, while the troops were sleeping, surprise, they were attacked by Chinese. Chuck was among, among 12,000 men of the 1st Marine Division, along with a few thousand army soldiers who suddenly found themselves surrounded by 10 Chinese army divisions, roughly 120,000 Chinese, outnumbered at least eight to one and at risk of annihilation high in the mountains of North Korea. Charles, his friend, spoke of being jolted awake by terrifying loud noises. Oh, I'm not making the right noise. <laughs> Pretend you're hearing gongs. Um, gongs, loud gongs, never ending gongs. What was happening? Where in the world was the sound coming from? The enemy was coming to kill them and the gongs were driving the troops crazy. Then gunfire, where was this coming from? Chuck and his buddy Charles became separated in the confusion of the Chinese overrunning them. Everyone was doing their own battle to keep from getting killed. Although Chuck had been signed to intelligence, now every Marine was a rifleman. They faced slaughter while trying not to freeze to death. Chuck headed for a foxhole that had been previously dug into the frozen earth with the help of explosives and bulldozers. Weapons were primarily machine guns and hand grenades, mostly hand grenades. Charles had 17, he didn't know how many Chuck had. And some of the Chinese also had handguns. During the night, an airplane with lights landed, so this helped. Then when daylight came, they regrouped and the Chinese temporarily moved out. The enemy had been nearly invisible in the snowy mountain landscape for they wore white parkas. They were reversible, the other side was green. And it was cold. Oh, it was so cold, frigid cold. Chinese were used to these temperatures with the cutting wind, but our troops weren't. Chuck told of wearing his summer weight uniform, but he had a heavy coat. His watertight boots stored the sweat during the day, then at night froze around his feet. Chuck's first Marine division was under the command of Chessie Puller, the most decorated Marine in American history. So what did Chessie say about the situation? We've been looking for the enemy for some time now. We finally found him. We're surrounded. That simplifies things. The night Chuck guarded Chesty's tent. Chesty stepped outside to ask, how are you doing, old man? Keep your feet warm. We don't want frostbite. Well, Chuck was 21, but Chesty called everyone old man. Although many lost toes, and fingers or worse, Chuck ended up with frostbitten feet. And then in 2004, a military doctor also diagnosed PTSD from his wartime experience. For the next couple of days, Chuck and fellow Marines rotated front line and then further back. He ate sea rations, frozen, went on line and slept with all his gear rations and frozen water. Chuck told of the dead whose bodies had frozen into grotesque positions, put on trucks <clears throat> for they never left a Marine behind. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dead bodies of the enemies were piled like sandbags as protection for our troops. After two brutal nights of attacks, the US Marines began organizing their breakout towards division headquarters, Cote 14 miles south. They processed by regiments of first, the 1st Marine Division, 
first the seventh and then the fifth. And Chuck's regiment was last, first regiment was last to break out using the only road from the chosen reservoir. Only 20% of the seventh regiment, the first to leave, survived the battle and the march to sea. More of the fifth and Chuck's first was a little more fortunate. Was this a retreat? The commanding officer said, quote, retreat hell. We're not retreating. We're just advancing in another direction, unquote. They walked down an icy mountainside, the road little more than a goat path, and temperatures of 30 to 40 degrees below zero, all while Chinese were shooting at them. No cover, heavy fire from Chi or, sorry, Chinese, Chinese snipers. After reaching Coterie, the forces once more began to break out, this time in the midst of a snowstorm. Are you ready for this? Another obstacle. Earlier that month, Chinese forces had blown up a crucial bridge over the treacherous mountain gorge, cutting off the evacuation route. Just when the bridge needed to be replaced, Mother Nature wasn't cooperating. A thick blinding snow began to fall at dusk. The Air Force was going to airdrop eight 2,000 pound bridge sections that could easily be built and put into place. But the skies would need to clear up if the planes were to see the drop zone at the makeshift airstrip. For the next two days, it snowed and temperatures hovered around minus 40, wind chill factors of minus 60. Marines kept looking to the skies in hopes of seeing a break in the clouds. Just when it seemed like all hope for the storm to subside was about to disappear, a faint white dot could be seen through the falling snowflakes. This small star provided a big beacon of hope for the Marines of Coterie. I didn't think I have time to show this, but Madeline, after you mention of visual aids. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, this okay. Here is the star of the coterie, and years later, uh, the coat the star of coterie became okay. I'm can't do it. Do two things. Became the insignia for the chosen few, an organization, an organization of ch chosen survivors with whom Chuck enjoyed attending meetings and sharing stories. While marching south one night, Chuck was warned not to look down. Then what could he be walking on that was so crunchy? When the truck ahead tapped brake lights, could, Chuck couldn't resist and looked down. You won't believe this, eyeballs, eyeballs. Years later, while at the dedication ceremony, an engineer told of being assigned to throw frozen bodies of dead Chinese in the mortar holes and then use equipment to crush them so our troops could continue their evacuation. Chuck also told of losing contact with his company and strangely was with two Marines he didn't know. They came across two four by trucks, one out of the gas and the other with a flat tire. So they siphoned gas from the one with a flat tire, hopped in the other truck and joined their convoy or a convoy. They later passed Chuck's company, all dead and their trucks burned. The UN evacuation to Hung Nam, North Korea was completed on Christmas day, 1950. What a celebration that must have been as they ate Christmas dinner on the ship, but also with heavy hearts for the horror they had witnessed and the thousands of lives lost, more from freezing temperatures than from the battle. Chuck never doubted he survived this ordeal because he was protected, protected by his guardian angel, who, of course, is our Lord and Savior. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marilyn. That was so moving. I, it, it just thank you for sharing. I read so much about it, but you made it so personal. Here are his medals. And I have more visuals, but we're yeah. fine. <laughs> okay.
Maybe in the question and answer, you can show more. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Bob Peck. He's Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, and he will recall Army School in Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana. Thank you, Marilyn. As Marilyn mentioned earlier, this is the second year in a row where uh, OAM has been doing this uh, Veterans Day program. So last year I talked about uh, taking the Army Reserve Officer Training Corps, which is ROTC at Ryder College. And this year I'm gonna talk about uh, my, my first duty assignment. Um, I, I, when I was at Ryder, I, uh, uh, when you're a senior in the ROTC program, you get to fill out a, what they call a dream sheet where you can choose one of the army at that time had 16 branches you can choose from. Most people who were, who were not uh, uh, involved with the, with the army think that the army is pretty much four basic branches, which is the most important branches, which are infantry, armor, field artillery, and air defense artillery. But there's, they have 12 other branches and and uh, have what they call service support branches. So I filled out my dream sheet and I majored in business administration. I thought I was interested in something like finance and the army has a finance branch, but you, have, you usually have to be an accountant to, to get that. And there's very few who get account, a, a finance branch. So I chose as my first choice, the adjutant general branch. And the adjutant general branch is pretty much, uh, it's, it's, it's also another small branch like finance, a little, it's a little bit bigger. But uh, the, the adjutant general branch is concerned with things like personnel management, administrative services, uh, recruiting, postal service, recreational services for the troops, things like that. And the army came back and they gave me my first choice. So in June, 1972, I graduated from uh, Ryder with a bachelor of science and commerce degree in business administration and a commission as a second lieutenant in the uh, Army, United States Army Reserve. Uh, at that time in uh, late uh, 72, early 73, the Vietnam War was just winding down. And I got a call from the uh, headquarters down in Fort Meade, I think it was. And they wanna know, since the fiscal year in the Army and the federal government ends the end of September, they wanted to know if I would uh, extend my, my uh, initial tour of duty into the next fiscal year. And the way the Army works for new second lieutenants is that everybody has to go to a branch basic course, and they're all over the country depending on what branch you got. So at the time, the Adjutant General Corps initial uh, basic course for officers was at Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana, Indiana, which is just outside Indianapolis. So in in March 73, I went on active duty in Fort Benjamin Harrison. Fort Benjamin Harrison was named after uh, one of the presidents who, who took up his, after, after he was out of the presidency, made his home in, uh, in Indianapolis. Fort Benjamin Harrison was, was a very small post. Uh, it housed both the Adjutant General School and the Finance School. And I was there from March 73 to June 73, taking the Army's version of these different topics. And uh, I thought uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison was a neat post. It was, uh, it was small, it, was, uh, it, had the, it had a big finance center outside of outside the post. And uh, I, uh, there was about 40, 40 lieutenants in the class and uh, me being an average type of person, I finished right in about the middle of the, middle of the 40 people. And uh, so I had a, I, it was a pretty good experience there. Um, the uh, years later, when I, this is when I was traveling around the country on my, on my, uh, on my trip sometimes, I, I flew into Indiana and as it turned out, Fort Benjamin Harrison was closed a number of years ago. They, the army does a lot of changes and they moved the finance and the, and the AG school back out of there and they went to uh, uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And, the, and over the years as the Vietnam War came to an end and the, and the government was uh, reconsolidating things, they turned over Fort Benjamin Harrison into a private uh, 
center, just like they did at Fort Monmouth a few years ago. And so right now, Fort Benjamin Harrison is a private company. They have uh, research, I mean, uh, business centers there and things like that. And uh, what I wanted to, the, the school was like, uh, it's a typical school where you, where you learn your, your different things with the adjutant general branch. The, uh, the, one of the things I liked about, uh, about going in the army, I, I, one of the primary reasons I went in the army was back in the early seventies, the, the, the government was drafting people into the, into the army for, for the Vietnam war. So I decided to join up uh, because of that. And that's why I took ROTC. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to, I thought the army was a good place to travel and I wanted to go somewhere that was more than 25 mile radius of Pennington, which is where I grew up. And two of the things I liked best, best about being at Fort Benjamin Harrison, which, which gave me the opportunity to travel and wasn't really related to the military. But when I first got there, it was late March, 73. And, and some of the people in the class organized a bus trip. And we went down to, we went down to Louisville, Kentucky, the first Saturday in May. And, and I got to experience the, the, the uh, Kentucky Derby. It was the year that, uh, it was the year that Secretariat, one of the best racehorses in the, in the history of horse racing, Won the uh, won the Kentucky Derby, and I got a I got to be positioned like a quarter mile from the end of the end of the uh, finish line, and and I was able to get a picture of Secretary coming down the stretch, and and then uh, the other thing was it was <laughs> it was uh, the spring of 1973, and the other big event was was of course the Indianapolis 500, and I was able to uh, I was able to. I went down to the speedway one day and I got a, I got a ticket. To, I was a single person at the time and it had some seats left over. So I got a ticket right on the, right on the infield grandstand, right by the finish line. And it was quite an experience because at that time, the Indianapolis 500 was, was still, was begun on a, on a, on Memorial Day, the Monday. And as it turned out, we went out there and there's four or 500,000 people and, and there was a crash right at the start of the race, and then it started to rain, and they delayed the race, and and uh, we went. They started up again on Tuesday, and it rained that day, and finally on Wednesday they finished it. And by the time we went there on Wednesday, the crowd was really reduced because because we were. Uh, I mean, people had to go home and stuff. But that was the the day it finished. It was kind of tragic that they had one race driver hit the wall on the fourth turn and he passed away. And, but I've, I've never been back to, to the 500 since then, but I, I enjoyed being in Indiana because of the Kentucky Derby and the, and the Indianapolis 500. The, uh, the, after I got out of, uh, of Indiana, they, there was uh, uh, the experience of being in the military. And, and I started out with, uh, with the Eisenhower General Branch, and uh, that's about where I, I well, one other thing about the about being in in the in the in the Eisenhower General Branch, I had a two-year obligation at the time. Vietnam was really winding down. By '73 came around, they didn't have, they were pulling, uh, uh, they were reducing the the strength of the, the force, and and I wasn't sure. I had a two-year obligation. I was trying to figure out. Uh, uh, what I do, would do in my life, and and they had this program at the time, which I applied for for Benjamin Harrison, was called an involuntary indefinite, which which you could extend your two years to go into a into an involuntary uh, into a voluntary status where they keep you on active duty. And part of the program was that um, if you went for this program, you could change your duty station. And since I had orders go, taking me to Fort Evans, Massachusetts, which was right outside of Boston, and I wanted to see other parts of the country since I grew up on the East Coast, I wanted to see other parts of the country. So I went to this involuntary status, and then I, I asked for a different post. And I wanted to go out West, so I got assigned to, I was able to get assigned to one of my favorite places, which was Fort Lewis, Washington, which is about eight miles south of Tacoma. And, and that's where I'll stop my story, Madeline. I, uh, 
uh, if we do this again next year and and we continue this, I I'll talk next time about my my beginning at Fort Lewis and what a good time I had out there, even though I had my ups and downs. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, and I thank you for some of the upbeat stories that you told um, that was important. And um, when you talk about Fort Lewis in, in Washington, um, Larry knows that well, that's where he sailed to Korea. So we'll, um, uh, he'll be interested to hear you next year talk about this. And I hope that there is a next year and that some of you know other veterans who would like to share their stories. But at this point, we're halfway through. We've heard from three of the six speakers, and I don't see that anybody has put anything in the chat box. Now, I understand that because it's really difficult to, to put something in there when you're listening and you don't want to miss anything. I'm with you on that. So it's not to say that if you don't use the chat box, you won't get a chance to ask a question, but just a reminder that it exists there if you want to use it. Okay, we'll move on then to the next speaker, who is Chris Newforth, Lieutenant U.S. Navy um, will share his experiences in the submarine service. All right, thanks. Can you hear me all right? Perfect. All right, thanks for having me on. Um, again, my name is Chris Newport. Uh, I grew up in Pennington. I grew up going to Pennington Presbyterian Church. In the, I can see the pews there where I sat as a kid. Um, so it's good to be back, at least, at least uh, digitally. So I'll talk briefly just about, um, I was in the Navy, I was a submarine officer um, for a short period of time, about seven years. So I'll talk briefly about my experience and um, and what uh, modern submarines are like right now in the US Navy. So again, I, I grew up in Pennington. I went to the Naval Academy um, after high school at Tocqueville Valley Central High School. Uh, majored in control systems engineering and ended up selecting submarine service um, out of uh, Annapolis. And I ended up on two fast attack uh, nuclear submarines as a division officer um, operating out of the West Coast and then one out of the East Coast. Um, so not a lot of time in the Navy, but, but quite a lot of experience during the, the relatively short time. Uh, you know, for the submarine officers, it's interesting. This is a legacy of Admiral Hyman Rickover, who's a very strong personality who established the nuclear Navy um, and kind of which led into the modern commercial nuclear industry in America as well. But his, his uh, fingerprints are still all over the modern nuclear Navy and every officer who goes to a nuclear submarine has to get interviewed by his uh, predecessor, Fort Star Admiral in DC at Naval Reactors. So I had to go through this interview process after college. Um, I got yelled at, everyone gets yelled at as part of the process. Um, and, but they did accept me and I, I ended up going to about, about a year and a half of training um, for, to, before you can go to your first submarine. And it started out with six months of, of what they call nuclear power school, which is a very intense, um, you know, schoolhouse uh, process where they teach you kind of master's degree level um, courses on reactor physics, chemistry, thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, uh, metallurgy. Um, and then you go to another school, a six month school at, at a, a, you know, t operating prototype reactor. I was in Saratoga Springs. And then that's where they teach you uh, all the stuff you learned in the schoolhouse. That's that they teach you how it actually works in, in an operating reactor. So the goal, kind of the goal of the program is, uh, particularly for the officers, is you have to understand if something breaks or something goes wrong when you're underwater out in the middle of nowhere, you have to instantly, you know, be able to recall in your head um, the circuit diagrams, the, the pipe diagrams, what that valve is, how it's built, what could be causing the problem. So they want you to be able to immediately be able to diagnose and understand issues since you don't have time to, you know, pull over to the side of the road and have uh, someone come take a look at it, so to speak. So that was about a year of, of again, really intense schooling, um, you know, long days, lots of studying, always, always on the verge of failure is what I felt like. Uh, but we got through, I got through that and they send you only three months of school and actually how to, how to run the submarine, the non-nuclear part of the submarine, if that puts things in perspective. So three months at a sub school, learning about the torpedoes, how to put out fires, stop flooding, things like that. Uh, and then they send you out to your, your first submarine where you show up as, a, as an ensign, a, a pretty green junior officer. Uh, and then you have to learn how to actually operate the things in the real world. So I spent about three, after that training, I spent about three years, again, on two fast attack submarines. Um, the Navy right now operates, um, all of the submarines that the US Navy operates right now are, are powered by nuclear reactors. Um, there's two different 
types. There's attack submarines and what they and then what they call missile submarines. The missile submarines are one of the primary um, elements of our strategic, the nation's strategic deterrence program. Um, so they they drive around in the ocean in the middle of nowhere, going literally going in circles, waiting for the order to launch. Uh, they they carry uh, several hundred nuclear strategic nuclear warheads on board on on Trident missiles. So they're driving around out there in circles right now, uh, you know, waiting for the order to launch their mission, uh, their missiles if there's a, a nuclear war, kind of the Cold War that everyone knows about. Um, and I think most people know it's called, you know, that, that it's called strategic deterrence. And the fact that they're out there uh, gives countries, you know, a reason not to attack us and we don't attack them. And that's, you know, prevented major war, you know, um, as, as the theory goes. So they're still out there. I was not on one of those. It's actually pretty boring. You, again, you just drive in circles waiting for something that, that hopefully will never happen. Um, I was on an attack submarine, which is, uh, in my opinion, more interesting. Um, attack submarines go out, they do mostly intelligence gathering. Uh, you know, these days, you know, these, there's not, there's not, you know, we're not at war with anyone. So mostly the attack submarines are out there doing intelligence gathering activities participating in exercises. Uh, they can launch Tomahawk missiles if called upon, although the surface ships are, are usually better at that. Uh, track other submarines. They can, they can bring special forces into places without being seen. There's a number of things they can do, pretty, pretty interesting different missions they can do. So it's always exciting when you're out on deployments on these attack submarines, always doing interesting things. Uh, so I did go on two deployments, one in the Western Pacific and then one kind of in the Middle East, uh, Mediterranean area. Um, both of those deployments, we did um, what they call missions vital to national security. So we we did secretive missions that that you know can't talk about. But it was it was very exciting stuff. Um, you know, got to make some real I hope you know what I think is some real impact on on you know the country and helping the country out. So it was exciting um, out there doing things where you, you know you, you can't make if you make mistakes, people can. Can cause an international incident or cause you know serious repercussions so it's, it's really very serious time you know very serious business so it was a very exciting thing to be doing as a, as a young you know young 22 24 year old um, out of college um a few minutes left here you know life on the submarine um again i was on attack submarines which were you know they're they're, they're large but they pack them full of equipment um, sonar equipment engineering equipment, the nuclear reactor, you know, everything to make the submarine run. And then the engineers kind of figured out where to put the people after they built all the equipment. So it's not, you know, the submarine's large, but the space for people is, is quite cramped on board. Um, you know, kind of not as bad as what you see in the World War II movies, but, but not far off. Um, you know, even for the officers, you know, as a junior officer where I slept, I slept in a tiny closet with nine other bunks jammed in the closet, kind of at right angles from each other, overlapping each other. Um, I had no lockers to store. Everything I owned had to be stored in a three or four inch pan underneath the mattress. Um, and you had dirty laundry, you had to sleep with the dirty laundry until you had time to, to, to wash it. So it was pretty tight quarters. Um, and then the, the, the enlisted crews, even worse, um, they, they do sometimes what's called hot racking. So they'll have um, two beds for three people. And so, you know, you're on your watch cycle. You go stand watch. And while you're on watch, someone else is sleeping in your bed. And then you switch, you know, you switch back and forth. And it's called hot racking because your bed's still warm from the person that was sleeping in it before. So it's, it's kind of a rough life on the attack submarines, um, particularly for the junior, the junior crew members. But um, Generally, they keep, they keep you so busy, generally, that you don't have much time to, to think about some of the, the non-ideal living conditions, I'd say. Um, again, the new, so modern submarines, like I said, they're all nuclear powered now, so they don't, the, the reactor can operate that, now they go the entire life of the submarine without needing to be refueled. Um, so there's, you don't have to ever put fuel in the submarine, so they can operate underwater, um, you know, almost indefinitely, as long as there's food. Uh, so the nuclear reactor needs no oxygen, doesn't need air. You don't have to come up and run the diesels like, like you see in the World War II movies. Uh, they also have machines on board that um, make their own oxygen through the electrolysis process, breaks down water into oxygen and hydrogen, and they use the oxygen to, for breathing. And then using desalinization, we make our own water as well. So basically, as long as nothing breaks, the submarines can stay underwater uh, indefinitely. Um, basically, the limiting factor becomes how much food you can carry on board. So I did two, two of these special missions we did were, were about 60 days submerged underwater without ever surfacing. Uh, and then we, then we pulled into port and 
basically fix everything that is broken over those 60 days. But, but the modern submarines, they can stay underwater for, for extended periods of time, which is a, a real big asset for the submarines. You, know, you can, you can uh, submerge off the coast of the U.S. And, and an adversary trying to track the submarine has no idea where it is. You know, two months later, it shows up again back off the coast of San Diego, and you have no idea where it was. So that's, that's a big asset. Um, I got about a minute or two left here, but, you know, I, again, I was a, it was called a division officer. Um, so I was kind of on my first tour on a submarine. And what I did was I was an uh, engineering officer of the watch. I operated the, kind of oversaw the operation of the nuclear reactor. And I was also the officer of the deck um, later on in my tour, which means I was the officer in charge of the, the operation of the submarine, you know, giving out all the orders and, you know, you know um, what you see kind of in the movies standing up in the conning area giving out the orders and then also we all you know the officers all had a division of people so i had the mechanics for a while i had the electricians for a while so i was in charge of the the paperwork and the and the leadership of a you know division of eight to ten of the uh, enlisted sailors that, that actually operate and run the equipment on the submarines uh, and then also because it's nuclear power we were constantly uh, training constantly taking tests constantly doing continuous learning uh, so a lot of our time was also spent um you know doing those tests and training and making sure we don't forget everything that we were taught. So that's about 10 minutes. Um, hope, uh, it's, it's a lot I went over, but hopefully that was a, a good overview for everyone of kind of modern, you know, modern US submarines and, and what they're like and what they're out there doing. So I appreciate the time and, and thank you everyone. Thank you, Chris. Um, we appreciate your sharing all that. You did pack a lot into that 10 minutes and you yeah. all are staying on time, which is really, Terrific. Um, and, and as you went along, I was having questions in my head and then sure enough, in the next couple of sentences, you answered the question. But I, I know I have questions for the question and answer period and I would guess that uh, other people do as well. But thank you very, very much. Sure. Um, okay, the next uh, speaker is Barbara Rockle and um, she will describe the positive impact of military service on the life of her late husband, Bill Rockle, who was an electronics officer third class in the US Navy. Barbara? Uh, I'm going to give a little bit different perspective of talking about the, the veteran William C. Rockle. He was born into a, a very poor family and uh, he had just graduated from high school recently when during the Korean War and he decided he didn't want to be an army man. He decided he wanted to be in, uh, enlist in the Navy. And that was probably one of the best things that he could ever have done. Uh, he got through uh, basic training in Maryland, and his first assignment was uh, out in California. I'm not quite sure what he did out there, but he did meet a wonderful fellow Navy man. And this Navy man exposed him to, to a different kind of life than Bill had ever known. He came from a good family, he liked good music, he liked fine things, and he had a great impact on Bill's thinking. They remained friends for many years after Bill retired from the Navy. His next, uh, next duty was to serve on a destroyer ship uh, and this he did, well, he, he says it's very hard to live on a very small boat, but he did it with graciousness. And his commanding officer sent a letter to his family uh, back in uh, December of 1953. And he said to his parents, I am so pleased to, form, 
to inform you that your son William has been advanced in rating to communications technician third class, and this is effective as of November 16th, 1953. And this promotion is not only the result of his high standing in a Navy-wide competitive examination, but is the result of hard work, good conduct, and considerable study. In promoting himself, your son has accepted a highly responsible job in the Navy service. And he has technical knowledge that your son has demonstrated, and he has qualified to be a leader among uh, his own division. Please allow me to extend my personal congratulations to you in your son's achievement. You have every right to be as proud of him as I am proud to have him in my command. Again, a wonderful booster for my husband, the veteran. His last assignment, he was sent to Bremerhaven, Germany. And there he served for about a year. Again, he met some wonderful Navy friends who encouraged him, who uh, made felt made him feel more important and very much uh, loved, and so his service was. He not only got to uh, serve his country, but after he was discharged, he finally decided that he would go to college, which I had been encouraging him to do. We got married soon after he got home, and he did uh, enroll in Trenton Junior College, which was in the heart of Trenton. You know, he had always said, if I could just go to college, and not have to take all that English and history stuff. Well, he got, he got involved in Trenton Junior College and he graduated from there and he spent his last two years in college in uh, Ryder College. And he graduated from there and he was very fortunate to get a job uh, teaching in his alma mater and my alma mater too, Hopewell Valley High School, as an English and history teacher. Lo and behold, he found out that he loved history and English more than he loved the math and the science. So, my story is that because Bill served in the Navy, his horizons were broadened and he got to serve his country. And then when he got jobs, he served his community. God bless our veterans. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. What a personal portrait. Wow. For those of us who knew Bill, we know him ever so much better. And for people who never met him, they have a real sense of him. Thank you, thank you. Okay, our last speaker is Private Larry Mancia, US Army, who will recall his time in an iron lung and take it from there in terms of uh, treatment that in the hospitals of both the army and then later the VA. Larry? Okay, can you all hear me? Absolutely. Okay, uh, there's a little time when I was in the army before I was in the Iron Lung. I was uh, shipped to Korea 
and it was very fortunate in the fact that I brought my baseball glove with me. And I found that out and I was shipped to a headquarters in the headquarters company where basically I sat behind a desk, played some baseball and did some umpiring. Uh, I also had a big opportunity on the day that is the anniversary of when the war started to go with the uh, foreign officer who was my commander, so to speak, to the Balcon Trading Company uh, where I was uh, got shark bin soup and all the rest of the stuff that goes with that. But the highlight of that day was that we all had to wear our sidearms. My sidearm was a carbine. The two officers then said, handed me their weapons, which meant that I had a 45 on my hip, a 38 under my shoulder, and a carbine over my other shoulder. And I finally made it to the, uh, the main PX. And I walked in there, and the first thing I saw were these three young guys in uh, their khakis who looked at me like I was Superman. And I felt so sorry for them, really did. The polio, I think, came from the swimming pool. Uh, I went to bed one night, not feeling too bad. Woke up the next day with what I thought was the flu. Uh, went to the uh, doctor, got a couple of shots. Came back and that night I fell out of my bunk. The next day they carried me down the stairs and I was in a hospital got the spinal tap and it was polio, bulbar spinal polio. So what happened from there, I went into a delirium and the next thing I know, I woke up in an iron lung. Do you all know what an iron lung looks like? Really? Uh, Describe it, Larry. Um, from well, it's, um, boy. it's a long tube much larger than the human body. And one end of it can slide off. You put somebody in there, then you put their head back through the opening with this gasket on. Now at the other end of the iron lung is a diaphragm, which is pulled back and air comes in, air goes out 18 times a minute. My job while I was in there was to try and get strong enough so that I didn't need the iron lung so they could ship me to Tokyo and then back home. I was uh, almost completely paralyzed. I was in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. And I spent a uh, little over two weeks there and finally, excuse my voice, uh, I was able to be uh, flown to the 8167th in Tokyo. I got to see Mount Fuji out the window when I got to the 8167th, they started therapy. Therapy uh, developed from uh, Sister Kenny's modification of hot water, loosen you up, and flex the muscles. Well, uh, some of you have been asked, I guess, at different times, would you rate that on a one to a 10? Uh, the arms and the legs were about a five when they were doing that. The neck was a 10. Every time they lifted that a little bit, bang. So I was there until the conclusion of the war. And I was flown from there to uh, Hawaii. And Hawaii had actual fruit and vegetables, fantastic, ice cream. And from there to uh, San Francisco, from there to Washington, and then on to Valley Forge Army Hospital. I continued with the therapy while I was there. I was informed uh, about uh, late in September that I would not get any better, that I was as good as I was going to get. And at that point, I uh, could use my arms and uh, move my head from side to side, but not much. And uh, I was shipped out of there to East Orange Veterans Hospital. I arrived there shortly after Thanksgiving. Uh, the therapy changed. I was uh, given uh, motion treatments and also muscle development. I improved uh, a lot there. I was able to get into a wheelchair 
really developed my upper torso. My legs were coming back gradually. Uh, they started to, uh, we, I, we tried the long leg braces, they didn't work. Uh, I was discharged from the, uh, arm, from the hospital, oh, after about a year or so. While I was there, I was actually uh, part of the staff and they're uh, producing their newspaper. I had a half hour radio show on a closed circuit thing, that was fun. So when I got home, it was uh, learning to live in a wheelchair. Uh, and somehow, uh, gradually, I was able to walk with crutches. And I, I did finally find a job and that was in New York. Drove there for a couple of years and decided that that was not it. Went to the VA, figured I'd use my uh, GI Bill. And the guy told me it was too late. I should have used it much sooner, but they would cover me if I changed what my profession was. So I went back to graduate school for English. Spent two years there, got out of that, and decided to teach high school. And that's where I spent the next 29 years of my life. A lot of that with my wife, whom I met at Princeton High School. Any questions? <laughs> I had a great time in the Army. I really did. I lucked out by going to Fort Dix. I had a great company. Really enjoyed the whole thing. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Um, that's quite a story, really. Um, thank you for sharing. Okay. In deference to each of our speakers, I'd like to give the opening opportunity for questions to each of the six of you if you want to ask questions or make comments to any other speaker. No? Anybody? Chris? See it was great to hear everyone's stories. Much appreciated. Okay. All right. I just, Mal, I just think this is a very nice program you have here with with it. OAM, and uh, it's nice to hear people's stories and their experiences in the military. Thank you for the comment on behalf of the whole committee. Um, any I other speaker yeah. want to ask a question? I would just like to thank, thank them all for doing this program for today. It was very special and very, mu very much appreciated. Thank you all, and thank you for your service. Thanks, Dee. Appreciate that. Um, are there other people who would like to either make comments or ask questions? Um, maybe it's a, a general question that you want to throw open to anybody that wants to answer it. Or maybe you have a question for a specific person. We have time. We intentionally, last year we scheduled it for an hour and it was not sufficient time and it was somewhat frustrating. So this year we scheduled it for an hour and a half, but still limited you you speakers, I admit, I'm, I'm guilty as charged, but um, did it intentionally in order to provide this opportunity. Um, and so let me, let me just kick it off with a, a question. And that is, I have a question for Chris, and that has to do with uh, your mention of Admiral Rickover. Um, uh, I don't know whether it's a true story or an apocryphal story, something maybe that all that you and all of your colleagues heard a million times and there's nothing new, or maybe not, I don't know. But the story was that Admiral Rickover would, um, when he was interviewing people for specific high level positions, would invite them into his office at lunchtime and order lunch for them. And, um, and if the it wouldn't be a sandwich, it would be like a dinner, but it would be at lunchtime. And, um, and he would pretty much observe the person. And if the person um, salted his food um, before tasting it, um, then Rickover immediately made the decision in his own head that that was not the man for him because he didn't 
take in all the facts first before he acted. Did you ever hear that story? Yeah, I've heard that story. Um, I'm not sure if it's true. I've read a few books about him. Um, I know I know he used to have a four-legged chair. He would make one of the three four legs a little shorter to make people uncomfortable when they were sitting in front of him. <laughs> he told someone to make him mad. Um, so the person wiped everything off, his, threw everything off his desk once, and then he, he said, welcome to the program. Uh, he put he made someone go in his closet once and then just left for an hour or two, I know, to see what he would do. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that story was, was true. He was, a, he was a extraordinary person and he made everyone angry, basically, is my understanding. An equal opportunity offender, as we used to That's call right. him. That's right, yeah. But he got things done. That's right. yes. What if that person didn't use salt, period? <laughs> Well, then he would look for some other <laughs> measuring tool, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, Larry, perhaps you would like to share the, the story on the way home from Korea when um, you ran into members of the Princeton Theological Seminary. It was a like right. small right. world story. Yeah, I was uh, flat on my back uh, in the airport. Uh, they were waiting to sh push me out board the plane. And these guys came to, uh, would you like us to sing for you? And I said, where are you from? It's at Princeton Theological Seminary. I said, well, you better be pretty good because I'm from Rutgers. <laughs> and uh, son of a gun, if they didn't look, us, look me up 50 years later, and I was guest of honor at their 50th reunion. That's a nifty story. Thank you. So by this time, somebody's thought of a question they would like to ask, and I'll throw it open to everyone. I just have a couple of comments. Um, the picture of Chuck's Marine picture is behind me, although it's a little difficult to, for you to see. Uh, the menu for Thanksgiving is on the wall, which I was going to show you, but I was so concerned about my time that I didn't think I could take the time for that. Um, and also, he was so, so proud of being a Marine for at least the last few years of his life, unless, except for once on um, Easter. And when he wasn't in the hospital gown, uh, he always wore a USMC shirt. It was just, it was just so, or jacket and whatever. So he was very proud of that. Hmm. Also, the, that star of Coterie that I was talking about, and it, like I said, it became this emblem of the chosen few. I recently talked to, with a high school friend who lives in Colorado who's talking about chosen few and she thought they only had it there. Well, this is an organization of people of all um, branches of the military who were involved in the, uh, the chosen reservoir uh, in that battle. And Chuck just, he had another cat, you know, he's had different, we call these covers, but this mm -hmm. like, don't have to rush, I think I'm under, under time limit to show you. This is one of them um, that he had. But also I was reading that that night when they saw the star in the sky, then from one group of Marines, and then it spread throughout them all. They sang the Marine Corps hymn. And that must have been very touching because they knew that there was hope and they would, the bridge would be laid and they would be able to continue going down south. And they boarded at, um, I can't remember the name now, but it's on the, the North Korea side of port. They got in ship. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Patrice. Well, I was wondering, this is to anybody, um, what was your transition like back into civilian life after this? You know, we've heard a lot of different stories about, you know, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard, sometimes, you know, does anybody want to speak to that? Good question. I would think mine was the easiest. Um, we were not at 
I did not go to a major global war. Uh, I had, you know, nuclear training, and it was uh, end of 2008, 2009, you know, as the economy was booming. So um, I had no issues. I would say that mine was the easiest, probably, of everyone that we've heard today. Okay. Okay. Bill, do you uh, want to get on that? Bill? Uh, Patrice, yeah, I... Uh, after I got out of uh, Indiana, I went to uh, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. I was out there for for over five years, and uh, I initially I thought I was going to stay on for a while, and I decided to get out. And I really liked uh, the Western Washington, the Seattle Tacoma area. I was going to stay out there. I <laughs> looked. I took about a year looking around for a job. And I, I don't think I was looking very hard, and I never did get a job. So the Army allowed you to move your household goods for up to a year after getting off active duty. So I came back to New Jersey. I was happy about it. As it turned out, I was happy about coming back to New Jersey. I, I, I applied for a, for a job down in Trenton, like got a state job. So I, I didn't have a lot of problems getting a job, but, but I, uh, I did enjoy the Western Washington at the time I was out there. Anyone else on that question? I, I I will speak, but I of course I didn't know Chuck at the time, but I know he had been a student at the University of Toledo in Ohio and when he went. And then when he came back, he uh, was the first to have the G, on the GI Bill to go to Michigan State. Um, that so that was, you know, it helped him in that way. Um, but that's, I can't really speak for him. Mm -hmm. Well, we have two questions in the chat box. Um, Chris, the first one is for you. And the question is, how many people are on a modern nuclear sub? So rough 90 to 110, depending on, on who's on board. You know, we have special people come on and off. But yeah, roughly 90 to 110, there's usually... Usually about 16 to 20 officers on board and, and then the rest of the enlisted crew that kind of run everything. So a lot of people, they jam a lot of people into a small space. So as a follow-up question, um, the, in terms of, of on, on a sub, um, you described how cramped things were for people on the sub you were on, um, or subs, plural, I guess. But... Um, but is that a different story nowadays? Is there more people room? No. <laughs> no, there's, you know, they have uh, Virginia class submarines and the Seawolf class submarines, but they're all similar. The attack submarines are all, um, they're very big, but there's not a lot of space left over for people. I will say the missile submarines are much bigger because they have to carry the missiles and they do have, it, those are much more spacious, um, but those are boring. They just go in circles, so that's not fun. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, the other question that's in the chat box at the time is what's, and this is addressed to each of you, and I say each because I think the person asking the question would really appreciate a response from each one of you, if you would be willing to do that. And the question is, what's one quality instilled within you by your military service? So. Um, Bill, why don't you start it off? We'll do it, go in order, so to speak. Okay, I think discipline, number one, absolutely. And uh, actually, I was going to make a career in the Air Force, but my wife was a music director, very, very, very talented. So um, that's the reason I elected, you know, to um, shorten my career and allow her to, uh, to allow her to you know, do her as a music director. So for 50 years, she served the Lord as a music director. And I got to fly on because I flew for Pan Am for my career um, and also flew for the Guard. So can you be more specific of when you say discipline? Um, that has a lot of, and maybe you mean sort of all aspects, but do you have something to 
Yeah. I Me? think Dave Wilson was rattling something there. I didn't catch the end of what you said. <laughs> well, I was just I just wondered when for Bill, um, in response to the, the question before we go on to the next person, that um uh, you mentioned discipline is the one thing that made an impact on you. And I wondered if if you wanted to be more specific by way of example or not, your choice. Well, uh, maybe you didn't hear what, what I was saying when I got out, I was gonna make it a career. Right, right. And, and you got all that. But I say, yeah, discipline that, uh, okay. that helped me later on in life and um, also my personal life and also with my career with Pan Am and uh, at home also and with our <laughs> children. And okay. I have to say, uh, we do have one son in the Marines. He's a Sergeant Major. So i um, served and is still serving in the reserve right now. Excellent. Um, okay, Marilyn, do you wanna Take a stab at that on Chuck's behalf. It's hard to say, but pride, as I mentioned before, pride in being a Marine, perhaps, okay. at least in the later years. Okay. Bob? I'm not sure, Madeline. I, I, I spent so many years on active duty and so many years in the reserves. I... Uh, I like I was kind of alluding to. I had my ups and downs, both in the active duty reserves. I kind of, I kind of decided to stick with it though, especially in the reserves. I was, I was, I figured I had so much time on, on active duty that I would, if I stick, if I stayed with it, I would get a pension out of it, which I appreciate. But uh, a lot of I had, uh, I didn't tell you my stories about active duty, but. <laughs> I had a lot. I had a lot of good experiences, but I had some bad experiences too. And I okay. All right, um, Chris. How would you answer that question? Sure. Yeah, mine's a little, maybe a little different because I was not a Marine or you know a soldier in combat. So, um, so I, the two things I would say, um, you know, first of all, just the you know getting thrown it, you know, just getting thrown in on these submarines at an early young age, relatively young age, it, it does teach you responsibility it just teaches you to get the job done and not you know there's no tolerance for um, complaining or you know excuses <laughs> there's just so few people on the submarines that if you don't get the job done they, they kick you off basically bring someone else in so you know kind of like the no excuses just just get your job done kind of um, you know military mentality I guess there but then maybe more importantly both from being an engineer in college and then the whole nuclear world engineering world I think that had a stronger impact on me um, just the analytical mindset, the questioning everything, you know, in the, in the nuclear Navy there, it's, it's, you know, very different than the Marines, for example, you're, you're, you're taught to question, you're taught to understand everything. If an officer gives you an order in the nuclear power plant and it's wrong, you're, you're expected to not follow it. You're expected to, to say that's wrong. So that whole engineering analytical mindset and that questioning attitude, um, that's going to stick with me forever. So kind of a, it's quite a bit different than your, you know, what you think of with, um, you know, um, Marines or, or soldiers in combat. So hope, hope that answers the question. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. And Barbara Rockle, you can you speak for Bill? Um, what do you think? I, I think you covered it in your presentation, but if you want to repeat briefly, what um, what you think was like the the quality that um, military service instilled in Bill. My phone's on, so they can hear you, but you may have to speak up. Anything about? We can't understand a word they say. <laughs> um, what quality do you think Bill um, acquired because of his service? What, what kind of influenced him afterwards? Do, are you? I, I think Barbara's done. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and and finally, Larry, what would you say? Um, 
not three pounds on them. Uh, what did I learn in the, in the service? Well, what, what quality, uh, one quality uh, would you say um, was instilled in you in your military service? Well, you learn to dodge jobs you don't want to do. That's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think it teaches you respect for people who deserve respect. Uh, I don't know. I I, I I don't know if any different from what I was there. Of course, I was only there a year, so. Uh, but I'm what I was there, really. Okay. For good or bad. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, does anyone else have a question? Or a comment? Either one? If not, I see that there are some comments in the chat box. If you would like to add a comment, please feel free to do so. This is a time for me to uh, give a special shout out to Clark Walker, whose voice you just heard a moment ago. Um, he's uh, OAM's favorite techie. <laughs> he, he's the one that makes these programs possible, especially in this day and age. And um, we are ever, ever so grateful for him. Thank you for putting your camera on, Clark. Um, we really appreciate all that you did. And uh, Clark today brought some people physically together, as he's been doing lately uh, in the church, um, even for an OAM meeting, so that um, people will once again have an opportunity, if they want it, to meet in person. But we have the hybrid so that we can do this by Zoom and have people from all over the country join us. And that's terrific as well. Okay. Um, I just realized, Chris, where are you? Where are you at right now? Because I think I'm not, too, I'm not too far away. I'm up in the seacoast of New Hampshire, Exeter, New Hampshire. Like my parents were up here last weekend. But you, I moved from California recently, so it's a lot closer than it used to be. <laughs> I think your dad's on. He's got a funny name called Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well. Thank you once again to each of the speakers, both for your service or your spouse's service, and also for sharing your stories today. They're absolutely priceless. And it will take a while, I don't know how long, but a while for this to um, um, be put up on um, the YouTube uh, account of the church, but it will be there and you can, um, share that information with others who were not able to join us today. Thank you again.